All right. Hello, everyone. My name is Nick Chow, and I'm leading Plug and Play Sustainability Team in Europe. Today, we are discussing the most important challenge of our century, which is reaching carbon neutrality to combat climate change. In a broad spectrum of carbon neutrality, today's event is focusing on the hard to decarbonize sectors of heavy industry, heavy transport, and agriculture. I'm extremely excited for our speakers and startup pitches because they're doing some amazing work. And for those who are new to Plug and Play, we are a global innovation platform and early stage investor. We have partnered with about 500 corporations across 50 different offices to fuel their innovation pipeline and drive corporate collaboration with startups in order to leverage the latest technologies for their business challenges. We are investing in about 200 startups per year and running 50 themed accelerator programs around the world. At Plug and Play, we have 18 different platforms from energy to new materials, to mobility, to food, to retail, and Plug and Play Sustainability is one of our platforms. Plug and Play Sustainability is a mission-first and problem-led platform focusing on some of the biggest challenges, starting with ending plastic waste, carbon neutrality, and accelerating a circular economy. We're committing more investments into startups who are building the sustainable future and working with a growing number of amazing corporations on sustainability initiatives, in big part because of our CEO, Saeed Amidi. And with that said, I'd like to turn it over to Saeed for some opening remarks. As uh, you may have known, we have launched our sustainability initiative now almost two years ago. We have had great success with Alliance to End Plastic Waste, running different programs in Silicon Valley, Paris, Singapore, and we just launched Shanghai. You know, these large organizations now have an incredible aggressive sustainability initiative and they need to become carbon neutral within certain time frame. I feel this time everybody is very serious in planning what they can do and more importantly executing it. Some of our corporate partners like Pepsi, Mercedes, Shell, I've been in discussion with recently, and not only they have plans for their own factories and refineries and uh, production facilities to be carbon neutral, but they are planning to ask their suppliers as well as their distributors to work together to have the, all the value chain become carbon neutral. They call that phase three. Phase one is what you're controlling yourself. And as you get farther from your uh, you know, product from suppliers and people who work with you, that becomes phase two and phase three. In any case, we are learning together with you. We love to find the best entrepreneurs, the best startups in the world who can work with us and with you to expedite this carbon neutrality journey as soon as possible. Hopefully we can leave a better world for our children. And this is not an easy job. I believe we all have to work together with a lot of energy, with a lot of discipline and make this happen to leave a better world for our children. Thank you so much and looking forward to having you with us in this journey. Thanks, Saeed. Now, before getting to the content and our speakers, um, I'd like to take this time to expand a little bit on our call to action on behalf of the sustainability team. Now, one thing that is clear is that carbon neutrality is going to require an unprecedented level of collaboration and of innovation. 
And climate change is a systems level issue. So the path to carbon neutrality requires a cross industry and cross value chain approach. And when you consider that we need to reach carbon neutrality and double the energy supply by 2050, this needs to start happening immediately. And so for plug and plays carbon neutrality initiative, we are taking a mission first and a problem led approach. We are working with partners that can lead a mission and that can bring together corporations in our ecosystem and drive innovation with all the key stakeholders around the table. The days of broad strokes for, for tackling this problem is behind us. Right now we know the problems, we now need to be more focused on finding the solutions and taking action. So moving forward, our team will probably spend a little less time on you know, open events and spending more time working closer with corporations where carbon neutrality is key to their innovation strategy. We plan on organizing group workshops, roundtables, and startup deep dives with these partners to make sure that we're identifying those business challenges and moving the needle closer to carbon neutrality and accelerating innovation. We're already working with some amazing companies like the Alliance to End Plastic Waste, British Telecom, PVH, BIC, and others, and the sustainability ecosystem is growing, which is amazing to see. And so our call to action is for the corporate members in the audience. Use your scale, use your expertise to collaborate with others who share that same mission and to partner with startups to solve these big challenges. So if carbon neutrality is key to your business and you want to lead by bringing together corporations across relevant industries and across your value chain, then we would love to talk with you. Uh, to start that conversation, we have a quick poll. Please let us know, we'll reach out, we'll follow up after. You'll also see this same poll after every single startup pitch because plug and play is all about making those connections and, and driving that innovation. Thank you for everyone who used the poll. If you missed it for any reason, I also have my email in the chat there. Feel free to reach out, but we're moving on to the main content. We'll be switching back and forth between industry speakers and startup pitches. So first up, we have Mikael Milimaki, head of external venturing at Fordham. He'll be talking to us about the state of carbon neutrality and his perspective on the most exciting technology opportunities. Hi, everyone. It's, it's great to be here. What I wanted to spend the next 10 or 15 minutes or so talking about to you guys is about uh, decarbonization in, in, in the big picture, how we see it. And then secondly, on venturing, how corporates and, and startups work together and why exactly we should be having both of these parties in, in the fight against uh, carbon, basically, and uh, pushing the decarbonization struggle forward. Let me start with the big picture, in that case, around uh, global greenhouse gas emissions. And it stands today, we're emitting about 50 gigatons of CO2 equivalent per year. And that stands in the context of, you know, 2.3 thousand uh, gigatons that we've emitted to, to date and about 600 or so remaining by many estimates in terms of what's allowed and what's possible before we start kind of banging against these two degrees uh, climate targets. And you can basically slice and dice greenhouse gas emissions in, in many different ways. And one of the easy ways of, of doing that is what you can see here in the chart. So dividing that into three parts. The first one of those parts is power and heat. So essentially electricity and heat generation. And that's relatively speaking, the easiest part to, to decarbonize. I'm sure everyone's familiar with wind and solar getting bigger and bigger penetrations in the energy mix today. And that movement is already well underway. The second part then is in agriculture and land use. This is a bit different in terms of what the greenhouse gases actually are. And this is more about rethinking how we use our land and uh, how we think about our food habits and, and all of that stuff. Now then the remaining 50% or so, these are areas where the path to decarbonization as per our view is, is really focused around electrification. And these, these different areas are more or less easy to decarbonize through electricity. For example, e-mobility, so the, the transportation of, of, of people in, in individual vehicles is, is already well underway in the decarbonization journey through the electrification of, of, of those cars. 
many models of depending a bit on you know what size of a car you're buying are already cheaper or close to price parity comparing electric vehicles to, to petrol fueled ones. And then on the other end of the spectrum, there's things like aviation, the steel industry, or, or, or concrete production, for example, which are a bit further away down that path. Now, if you look then at these three big areas, the, 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 this implies that there's basically three ideas we need to be innovating in and finding and funding these areas in order to decarbonize the world in, in a quick time frame. The first one is enabling larger renewable penetration in, in electricity. So really getting the wind and solar penetration from 10% it is today close to the kind of 80% range. Secondly, then electrification of the moderate and hard to abate sectors. So really both the hardware innovation as well as the software innovation side in, in making this possible and making it also accessible at a fair price for everyone. And finally, then the cost competitive ways to, to sequester carbon. So finding the business model, which allows creating value from, from, from carbon, for example, through uh, sequestration of carbon in, in topsoils, and then having that kind of positive externality of, of sequestration as just to add on in, in those business models. Why, why does working with startups matter in, in this context then? What you can see here in these pictures is probably very familiar to some of you and is really one of my favorite pairs of pictures out there. On the left hand side, you see the New York Easter Parade in uh, 1900 and in this big pool of horses and carriages there's just one car and uh, it's kind of an early innovation at that stage and cars in many ways are the superior mode of transport to, to to compared to horses both in terms of you know not getting tired there's leather seats air conditioning and they don't really defecate in your in your driveway when you're not using them and despite the fact that these are fairly expensive tools just 13 years later a picture of the same parade we can see just one horse and carriage and, and many cars. And this really proves the, the rate of, of change when superior innovation comes in and displaces something older. And it's not only that this happens very fast when it makes sense, but it's also something that is, is increasing in pace the whole time. If we look at the last year, for example, with the coronavirus uh, vaccines, that was a very, very fast development. And um, in this whole context, if you look at the difference between uh, corporates and startups, one of the number one differences is really agility, namely how fast companies bring to market and develop in the background products. And at the same time, startups are taking a lot of the, the talent out there and really attracting the best people in the world in many domains. On the other hand, though, corporates have many areas that you know startup founders really give a arm and a leg for, for example, know-how, access to customers, or just the funding and, and capital side of it. And my hypothesis really is that between these kind of two, two good worlds, there's an area of overlap where you can really make the best out of both corporates and startups. And that's what we should really strive for in order to decarbonate, decarbonize the world in a time frame equivalent to this kind of 13 years you're seeing here in, in the two pictures. What you can see here on this slide then is um, one of my favorite pictures in terms of demonstrating and visualizing the different activities in innovation and venturing we're doing at Fortum. I'm not gonna go through all of these areas one by one, but the key message I want you guys to take away from this is, is, is really you need to approach collaboration between corporates and startups as really a portfolio of activities, the kind of tool sets with, with many tools that fit the purposes needed. And this is because if you look at the space, there's many different dimensions. For example, the, the stage of, of the actual innovation or startup that you're seeing here from, from left to right, there's the element of if that innovation is done fully in-house or, or externally by an external startup or perhaps it's collaboration between uh, external uh, startups and, and corporations themselves. And then finally, there's also the element of capital expenditure or intensity. For example, comparing startup pilots, they can see here in the, you know, the slide in the middle bottom, to uh, investments by, by companies and that at Fortune we do through our growth club, uh, Valkia, which you're seeing here in the middle top. Uh, directly on our balance sheets, or maybe one of our venture capital funds, EIP and the Valor Ventures here on the bottom right are mentioned. So these are very, very different in terms of what actually is required in terms of capital and uh, other resource expenditure for corporations. So the bigger picture really is there's many ways and types of, of collaboration and you really need a tool set to, to apply the right tool to each one of those use cases. And that's what you're seeing with these different texts and logos on, on this slide. 
Finally, I wanted to mention a few of the interesting areas we find um, innovation happening in relevance to our field at, at Fortune. And obviously, there's a long list of things. I really want to condense this down to, to a couple of boxes and a couple of bullets. And these are divided across the, the near term and the kind of longer term uh, areas. So in the near term, we're really looking at innovation, which is happening very, very fast today. And we expect to become very, very big in scale and highly penetrated already by the end of this decade. And on the longer term, where we're looking at innovations, which we expect to be at scale as, as very big things on the kind of two or three decade scale, but really the jockeying for position is happening today. And it's important to also be investing in these. On the near term, flexibility and storage is one of the interesting areas. So moving from this linear world in energy production from uh, producing according to a certain fixed demand specification, just kind of two-way streets, including demand side management, but also the kind of physical or virtual storing of these energy of this energy momentarily within that value chain through uh, lithium-ion batteries, for example, or, or virtual power plants, which is kind of a demand side management tool. Uh, another big area on the near term is the electrification. So this is touching more on the second point I mentioned there on, on, the, on the first slide, electrifying of mobility, uh, of heating, and even the first industrial sectors we're seeing electricity become a bigger and bigger player. On the mobility side, a really important area is not just the hardware innovation as such, but how do we make this accessible to, to, to everybody to increase the penetration? If you look at um, the, the electric vehicle experience today for consumers, that's not you know, the best customer experience out there. So really making car charging easy is, is a good example of, of software innovation that really allows for faster electrification and thereby decarbonization of, of the mobility and transportation industry. On the longer term, one of the big areas we see is circular economy. So kind of the big concept of getting your, your carbon atoms, your oxygen atoms, and your, your hydrogen atoms in the right constellation, in the right place. And here we really see a kind of merge of, of the waste streams or the biomass streams of, of even emission streams like carbon dioxide directly, and then using those to produce fuels or textiles or whatever else you want to produce. And there, carbon use utilization and storage is a big area, but also sustainable materials uh, broadly in, in terms of the use cases. Uh, the fourth and final area I want to highlight briefly here is what I'd call the, the next generation technologies, including um, hydrogen clean gases, but and of course, you know, more longer term looking at storage technologies. So really covering this seasonal storage area where we don't really have hardware that exists today to do that in, in practical prices. So this is really all about how do we store and, and transport energy and allow the energy to be used in the right use cases in the right way in, in the future. I'd love to spend you know, another hour talking about these areas. I know we've got excellent speakers lined up in the rest of the, the event today with uh, examples of startup pitches and examples of deep dives. So let me give it let me give the floor to, to those people to talk a bit more about that, those areas. And I'd love to be part of the conversation going forward. Thanks very much, guys. It's always great to listen to Mikel's insights for any startups who are interested in learning more about how Fordham invests, works with, or, or supports startups. I just put a link in the chat here. Feel free to check it out for more information. Next up, we have our first startup pitch from Boston Metals. They are on the mission to decarbonize steel. And just remember, right after their startup pitch, there'll be a poll that pops up on your screen. So you can let us know if you're interested in connecting them, connecting with them through an email introduction. Thank you everyone for tuning in virtually to hear about how Boston Metal is seeking to change the way steel is produced and to make steel production emissions free. Uh, my name is Adam Rowering. I'm the VP of Business Development at Boston Metal. And a little bit about the steel industry, if you're not familiar. Uh, steel is obviously a, an abundant material. About 2 billion tons of steel are made each year. Uh, to put that in context a little bit, that's a quarter million Eiffel Towers every year of steel. And if you look at other high volume metals like aluminum, you know, steel dwarfs them, only about 60 million tons of aluminum. But the problem with steel production is that you know, mankind has been good at making steel for about 3,000 years uh, and, been, and has been using the same formula for that time since the Iron Age, mixing coal or carbon with iron ore to get liquid iron. And as a byproduct, you get CO2. And today, with you know, nearly 2 billion tons of steel being produced, that process in a blast furnace accounts for over 8% of 
of global CO2 emissions. Uh, but the industry is seeking solutions to change that. Um, of the major steelmakers, many of them have very aggressive targets uh, for near-term uh, reductions in CO2 and by mid-century to be carbon neutral. And to do that, uh, you're gonna need to change the formula for steel production. And that's what we're doing at Boston Metal, developing a new process for steel production. We're no longer using carbon in any fashion, instead replacing carbon with electricity to provide the heat and to provide the reduction of iron ore into very high purity iron. And as a byproduct, you get oxygen gas, no carbon, no CO2 emitted. So you can do steel production in greater Boston like we are today. Uh, so that gives you emissions free steel. Electricity is a key component of our process, but where electricity prices are competitive, you can produce steel cleanly and do it at the same commodity prices that steel is being produced at today. And it's a very modular technology, which allows us to scale down the technology, which we are doing today to produce very high value alloys for customers. We have uh, hardware in the ground on the ground uh, in Brazil at a customer site, but also it can scale up to, to address a market for billions of tons of, of steel. And that's the mission that we are on. Uh, in the next two years at our facility in Boston, we are demonstrating at really what we call semi-industrial level, continuous production of emissions-free steel. And going forward from there, we'll be demonstrating uh, around 2024 a full-scale module, which would then be the building block for building larger, larger projects of emissions-free steel. And we're in the process of working and, and vetting partners right now for those early projects. And supporting us in this mission, uh, we just announced uh, recently the close of a $60 million Series B round. Uh, we saw two of the top three iron ore companies join that, BHP and Ballet but also an extremely strong, really world-class syndicate of investors that are helping us on this mission to change how steel is produced and to eliminate emissions from steel production. And uh, along with that capital and with that mission, uh, we are hiring extensively right now, uh, a number of positions in the engineering and R&D department. So if you like the story that you've heard and would like to learn more, please check us out on LinkedIn and our career page uh, and submit your application. Thank you very much. Great to great to talk about everyone. Bye bye. All right, you should see a poll on your screen, so please use it if anyone is interested in connecting with them. Um, they are doing some amazing work in one of the hardest to abate sectors, so I encourage you guys to use that poll, and we'll look to make email intros after this. Moving into the second segment, we have a fireside chat with Dana Hernova, who is the Global Carbon and Waste Performance Manager of Danone. She's doing a fireside chat with my colleague, John Mann, who's our Ag Tech Specialist. They're talking about things like soil sequestration, regenerative agriculture, Danone's net zero strategy, and what innovations they're most excited about. Listen in. Hi, Dana. Thanks for joining us today. To get started, um, would you like to give just a quick introduction on yourself and your role at Danone? Hi John, nice to meet you as well and I'm very happy to be with you. So my name is uh, Dana Horanova, I'm the Climate and Waste Performance Manager in the Essential Dairy and Plant-Based Division in Danone. And uh, prior to joining Danone, I worked as a consultant in Deloitte's uh, Sustainability Services, serving uh, companies and governments on their uh, transition to sustainability. That's so very awesome. happy to be with you. <laughs> Awesome. It's awesome to have you. Um, so Danone has a strong connection to natural resources. Can you share a little bit about Danone's net zero strategy and roadmap? Yeah, of course. So uh, I would like to share uh, three axes regarding our carbon strategy. Uh, so the first one is about our commitments. Uh, we have been uh, among the first uh, companies that have taken uh, an engagement to become carbon neutral by 2050, already in 2015. And uh, then in 2017, we joined also the science-based initiative. And uh, that means that we have science-based targets, meaning that our annual GAG uh, reduction effort is in line with our uh, responsibility to keep the limit, uh, to limit the global warming to two degrees. And uh, then finally, in 2019, we even uh, went farther and signed a pledge on 1.5 degree trajectory. That means that we will even strengthen our annual reduction efforts to be in line with the 1.5 degree trajectory. So that was about the commitments. 
And the second aspect is uh, about our brands because some of our brands uh, are, have moved it, uh, a little bit faster. So Evian and Volvic are already carbon neutral. And uh, the last aspect uh, of our strategy is also uh, development of plant-based uh, products. So Danone is supporting the flexitarian diet and uh, we have become a leader in the plant-based products as well with uh, brands such as uh, Silk, Alpro, and recently the acquisition of Follow Your Heart. That's awesome. It's fantastic to see such kind of fast movement from a, a large corporation. Um, so there's been growing interest in regenerative agriculture. Can you explain more about soil sequestration and the potential impact soil sequestration can have to limit CO2, CO2 in the atmosphere? Yeah, so indeed, uh, the agriculture is responsible for 25% of the worldwide GAG emissions. And so uh, it is a strong lever to reduce the emissions. Uh, so the emissions are mainly based uh, and due to the current system, which is uh, oriented to productivity and taking into account little the, the balance of uh, the uh, ecosystems. So now the regenerative agriculture is about making agriculture less part of the problem, but more part of the solution. And uh, what is um, a powerful tool is that uh, carbon in fact, is uh, the building element of all organic matter. And this is why organic matter has a huge potential to act as a sink for carbon and sequester carbon in the soil. So to make this happen, we need to enrich our soils in organic matter so that the carbon rather than release to the atmosphere uh, gets to the ground. And uh, if you want to know even more about this, uh, you can watch uh, the documentary Kiss the Ground that was released in uh, Netflix uh, last year. Um, and so, so when it comes to Danone and regenerative agriculture, so we, have, we are part of the worldwide initiative uh, 4 per 1000, uh, that is a, a platform to catalyze the action and to help transitioning towards the regenerative agriculture. And we are partnering and supporting our farmers uh, to move towards regenerative agriculture models. And for instance, in France, we have the commitment to source 100% of ingredients from regenerative agriculture practices already by 2025. Wow, that's that's absolutely fantastic. So when it comes to this uh, soil sequestration and regenerative agriculture, what are some of the key challenges that the industry needs to overcome to make this net zero transition possible? So transitions generally take time. So uh, one challenge is uh, for sure about um, being capable of engaging and embarking all our stakeholders. Uh, so this is what we're doing when we work closely with our farmers and accompany them in, uh, in this transition. Then uh, what we observe is also that the transition happens uh, more quickly in a market where governments and regulations uh, support uh, this transition and have also targets, uh, countrywide targets uh, towards uh, low carbon economies. And um, uh, one uh, other challenge that I would uh, mention also is uh, to have common uh, methodologies to be able to account for carbon sequestration to ensure fair play and to a quality of data uh, with regard to, uh, to accounting our progress. So you mentioned the farmers. Um, I'm curious, when it comes to making investments in this space, it, you know, does it start with helping the farmers at this early stage, investing in new technology, or kind of somewhere in the middle? So uh, when it comes to the transition to regenerative agriculture, there is a whole set of uh, things that we can do, uh, ranging from uh, very basic practices to help them uh, improve their productivity, and so that also is a, a positive thing in uh, economic terms for them, towards more technological investments uh, once we have uh, done the basics and the quick wins in the farms. And uh, uh, supporting them uh, can go through different channels. So uh, for sure, a uh, part of uh, our engagement is also to empower our farmers and to ensure that they have uh, uh, guaranteed revenue. So it also is about contractual arrangements that we have with them, such as the pluriannual contracts or guaranteeing on taking into account the cost of production. 
And then uh, it also uh, is about uh, more uh, more specific investments through programs that we have by investing in uh, uh, in technologies or uh, or other techniques that they are implementing uh, for regenerative agriculture. That's awesome. It's great to see you guys going going straight to the source and, and helping the farmers. Um, so what goes into making your decisions on carbon offsetting, whether it's, you know, nature based, high quality, verifiable, trackable, what goes into that? Yeah, so in the non, we believe that the first thing and most important thing we have to do is to first reduce radically the carbon emissions uh, within our value chain. So that means insetting rather than offsetting. And uh, for instance, uh, we have already uh, managed to reduce uh, our emissions compared to the 2015 by 24.5% on a like-for-like -like basis in uh, intensity full scope. And uh, so uh, this is what the effort that we want to continue. Uh, well, then in uh, case of emissions that we are not able to avoid within our direct value chain, uh, the offsetting comes as a last resort. And so uh, that implies financing projects uh, outside of our value chain. Uh, we have a dedicated team to analyze the quality of projects in uh, this case. And uh, for instance, uh, Danon invested in uh, the Livelihoods Fund, which is a fund that finances uh, uh, different projects uh, uh, that help uh, transition local communities to low carbon solutions. So we have a lot of entrepreneurs and innovators in the audience. Um, what type of innovation are you looking for or what types of innovation are you most excited about? Yeah, so um, I would like to, uh, first of all, pay a tribute to all the innovators that uh, you have uh, in your room, because it's uh, thanks to the innovations that uh, we can move forward. And uh, so we are excited about learning uh, about innovations uh, that can help us reduce carbon footprint all along the value chain, whether it is uh, sourcing practices, packaging, logistics, uh, energy. So really all types of um, uh, innovations. Now, uh, I could maybe uh, uh, note and to develop four of them uh, that uh, I think they are uh, interesting also within my own uh, practice of in Danone. So uh, the first one would be about uh, reduction and further reducing the carbon footprint of milk, uh, because uh, we have already uh, had some breakthrough innovations that help us go beyond what we have thought uh, previously uh, possible. And so uh, I hope that there will be more of such innovations that will uh, help us uh, further reduce the carbon footprint of milk. Then uh, the second uh, aspect uh, I would be interested in also uh, is about uh, finding alternatives to ingredients that we use in our recipes, uh, which have a uh, lower carbon footprint, but uh, can ensure the same quality of the product in terms of uh, taste, texture. For instance, um, so in the third type of innovations is uh, more in the energy field. And uh, uh, so while we are quite uh, uh, knowledgeable about uh, uh, electricity solutions, uh, uh, there is still a lot to do about thermal energy, uh, renewable thermal energy. And um, for instance, the International Energy Agency is calling governments uh, to uh, to support the innovations and uh, development in this field. So anything that can help uh, is, uh, is more than welcome. And uh, finally, in Danone, I'm also in charge of uh, reducing waste and especially food waste. So uh, I am also keen to learn about any innovations uh, with regard to circularity, how we can use in our product ingredients that are, for instance, co-products of our production or of uh, production in, uh, in other uh, industrial uh, uh, production processes. So uh, that would be the fourth. Uh, and uh, I am sure that uh, there are many more that I, I have not, uh, not uh, stated. So just to summarize that a bit, uh, so we're looking at a lower milk footprint, lower impact ingredients, new energy models, and food waste reduction. Um, that, that's correct, right? Yeah, very easy summarized. Awesome. Awesome. So yeah, to the audience, um, if you're attacking any of these pillars, please let us know. Um, drop a message to Nick or myself. Um, Dana, it was a pleasure. I appreciate your time, your thoughts, and your insight. Um, thanks again for anyone in the room. Shoot us a message if you're tackling any of these areas. Thanks a lot, John. See you later.
Awesome. Bye-bye. Thank you, Dana and John. And so sticking with the theme of nature, we have our second startup pitch, Salvera, bringing data and trust to the carbon offset marketplace for nature-based solutions. Remember about the poll at the end if anyone wants to connect with them after this. Protecting and adding to the carbon stored in forest and soil, so-called nature-based carbon, is the biggest single lever to hitting net zero by 2050. And this is driving the rapid growth in the billion dollar carbon market, which is projected to 100x by 2030. However, poor data is threatening to slow and hit and inhibit the next phase of this market's growth. Silvera is the only company building data and products ready to power a $100 billion global market. But let's step back a little. The world has to navigate the trajectory to net zero over the next 30 years. And what that means for the next decade is a COVID level 7% reduction of emissions every single year for the next decade, and then a continued ramp down from there. Layering on top of that, an unprecedented rollout of negative emissions for which no technical solution exists. And voluntary markets, the offset markets are gonna to have to step up and deliver up to 10% of this. What does this mean for a corporate? Well, the trajectory is equally as daunting. Like this is Microsoft, their recent sustainability report, which came out, which is, which is an excellent piece of work, shows their, their next 10 years navigating to net zero. They're saying like a more than 50% reduction in emissions um, and a ramp up to an offset spending of 50 to $200 million. And it could, depending on price volatility, be significantly more. Now, for Microsoft, that hit to their margins is not significant. Um, however, they're a low emitting business. So if I was a CFO of a business with, that was emitting more and with lower margins than a tech company, I would be seriously uh, concerned right now. And navigating this early is only going to make the pain less. And uh, it's not all pain because somebody is stepping up to pay for this. And thankfully, the asset managers have committed $15 trillion of assets under management to net zero. And what this means is there's going to be preferential allocation of their AUM to businesses, uh, equity and debt. And that's going to reduce uh, who are net zero. And that's going to reduce the cost of capital for net zero businesses. That reduction of cost of capital is in many cases going to pay for the cost of the transition. But again, this needs data. And that's where we come in. We're building the trusted data that unlocks the entire market, giving the audit trail and the ratings that the markets need. And we do that by providing a um, quantification of carbon stocks in forest and soil using advanced machine learning applied to satellite data. And we're not just using the state of the art, we're pushing beyond that with some of the world's leading research institutions. And we deliver that data, both with an API for institutions, banks, exchanges, et cetera, and through for, to buyers and corporates through our SaaS web application. And it's not just us saying this, we're on track to sign a channel partnership deals where we'll be distributing our data with intermediaries of exchanges and brokerages that cover 50% of the offset trading volume. And we're also working with some of the biggest financial institutions, data providers, and global management consultancies who are navigating their transition to net zero and that of their clients. So only Silvera's combination of tech, market, and finance skills can solve this. I'm a machine learning PhD with 10 years experience running sustainability and tech companies. And my co-founder, Sam, is a hedge fund lawyer turned ESG lawyer who's been behind some of the world's largest carbon offset transactions. Our chief of staff player is an ex-banker turned operator at Uber with a Stanford MBA. And we're backed up by an incredible tech and analytics team, world-class investors, advisors, and a diverse and effective culture. Now, for buyers, the value proposition is clear and it's significant. We are uh, web application products lets you screen, track, and report on your offsets. So it covers your um, buy side, uh, just price and quality discovery. And by providing that due diligence layer, we can let you cut 50 to 75% of your carbon offset purchase costs by avoiding middlemen. We also provide reporting functionality 
that will let you report to your investors and customers and crucially claim this reduction in your cost of capital in the medium term. So if you're a business that's navigating a net zero transition or you want to help power it, then we'd love to speak to you. Thank you. I love the problem that Salvera is using. You should see a poll now pop up. Please use that if you're interested in connecting with them through an email intro. We'll make that intro after this. All right, moving into our last segment of the day, heavy transport. We have Monica Araya, the transport lead for the climate champions at the UN Race to Zero, listening to a fireside chat, talking about the state of heavy transport. Hi, Monica. Thank you so much for joining us. We're really excited to talk with you today. Um, maybe just to jump right in, can you introduce yourself and, and you know a little bit more about the climate champions? Hi, Nick. Thank you for having me. Very excited to be here. Uh, so I am Monica Raja, and I am the transport lead at Climate Champions. Climate Champions is a team of global experts. Uh, we work with the high level climate action champion for COP26. And COP26 is a UN climate conference. It happens every year. This year is going to happen in Glasgow. And in November, we're going to go there. It didn't happen last year for, for obvious reasons. And basically, we have a race to zero campaign. And our role is to activate non-state actors. That is companies, investors, cities, states, entrepreneurs. And the goal is to achieve a net zero economy across the board no later than 2050. So action has to happen as soon as possible. And that is what we call race to zero. So I'll, I'll give you more details as we proceed with this conversation. Okay, perfect. And so maybe just to set the scene here, right? let's start with understanding you know, what is happening right now. We have you know, consumer battery electric vehicles that are starting to make a breakthrough. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to heavy transport, buses, trucks, and you know, where are we in this net zero transition for heavy transport? Yeah, it's, it's a super exciting space uh, to be in because of all the things that are happening. You have these manufacturers saying they are not going to produce any more traditional vehicles by a certain date, more recently GM. You have a lot of dynamics when it comes to cities and the zero emission zones that are basically sending a, a signal that if you want to circulate downtown, you won't be able to do that if you have a, a car that has a tailpipe. So that's that's quite transformational. And, and now when we start moving to, to heavy transport, we also see things happening there that were unthinkable a few years back. For example, last year in June, you had California deciding to, to become the first market in the world where you have a rule that accelerates the sales, the sales of zero emission trucks. And that is super important because it has concrete numbers, you know, by the end of 2030, between 30% and 50% of the sales will have to be zero emission. And it, it gets very specific about the, the, you know, these percentages between 2030 and 2035, and then eventually it gets to zero emission of vehicles and at a hundred percent level. What is also very important is that um, because a lot of this is, is, is about creating opportunities for, for manufacturing, you know, for example, California could be a hub for zero emission um, trucks. But we also have to think about the fact that there is a, a clean air dimension to this, you know, a lot of communities want clean air. And in addition to that, we know that the pollution from diesel trucks affects everyone, but affects low income communities in particular. Yeah, you definitely hear this growing talk of a, a just transition, which you know, I, I think is is going to just get louder and louder. And you 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 touched on a little bit of, of this already, but we have startups, OEMs, big fleet managers in the audience. You know, from your perspective, what is the role of these different players when it comes to the transition? 
Oh, that's a very important question, Nick. Thank you so much for raising it like that, because we tend to work in silos and that's not going to lead to a big transformation and, and, and acceleration requires a lot of activation throughout the value chain. So, so basically, we need to have to, to, to work with, uh, inside the champions, we call them, you know, the, the, the drivers for supply, demand, finance, and policy. So, of course, we, you know, if, if we work with manufacturers, we're going to have to agree, um, you know, a vision. And in the case of, of tracking, we say 100% ZEF sales by 2040, ZEF meaning zero emission vehicles for leading markets and for leading companies, obviously not for everybody. But it's super important. And, and I hope we have uh, a lot of fleet owners in the audience today because we do need a lot of demand acceleration strategies. And we have already seen with fleets, you know, for example, for vans, that there is more demand than a lot of manufacturers were um, predicting. And we need that demand acceleration in the track business, especially because we are going to have to create that that interface between demand and supply. What we also need, and this is something that the, the manufacturers themselves seen as a key driver, is also the push for zero emission zones in cities. And this is already happening. And we see a lot of cities taking the lead. So for example, Amsterdam is going faster than the Netherlands. Paris is going faster than, than France. And you have this combination of, as I mentioned before, climate, clean air, um, just transition elements that basically say in this area here, if you want to circulate, fine, it's going to have to be zero emissions. So we have to mainstream that zero emissions mindset in a lot of the discussions. So it's not just a little bit of efficiency or a little bit of improvement. I, I want to touch on something that you mentioned, which is that that mindset from your perspective, how should we be approaching technology and innovation based off of where we are today? The starting point is that we have this fossil free vision and then we have to say, you know, how do we make sure we, we enter in this, what we call in climate change is race to zero. You know, it's a race. It's not a walk around the street. You know, it's a race. We are in a hurry and it's to zero, zero emissions. So what needs to happen in order to get this race to zero in heavy transport? And one of the things that we have to keep in mind is the efficiency of these technologies. So we have to be as efficient as possible. And we know that from a societal perspective, um, we also need to make sure that the, the you know, that electricity, that energy is, is as clean as possible, as, as clean and, and in this case is basically renewables. So what we also need to keep in mind is that, um, you know, companies have to make a lot of decisions and that is going to be about their business models. So what are, you know, what are the options to make sure that the transition is, is you know, as cheap as possible for companies knowing that, you know, there will be a lot of costs involved. So if we put efficiency and, and the economics of this together, we know that for most segment, segments is going to be electrification. The question is, what are the niches where we see the role for other technologies? And of course, there are many opportunities there for, for hydrogen. So I, I think the, the question for me is, how to make sure that we have the most productive discussion about, you know, where is efficient to do something and where is important to find niches where that prevailing technologies is not the, the best option rather than uh, start a, a very open-ended and sometimes um, black and white discussion about option A versus option B. But because I come from Costa Rica, actually, I came back from Europe yesterday from Costa Rica. I, I do think a lot about the global south emerging markets. And, and, and for a different discussion, we also need to have a lot of innovation for, um, for those markets so that we don't end up in a world where you have zero emission trucks in Europe and the US and then you ship all the all the, the polluting technologies to Latin America, Africa, and Asia. I know this is for a different topic, but I needed to mention it. Yeah, you know, maybe, maybe to, to start wrapping up here, you know, we saw that you recently launched the Breakthrough Challenge for heavy mm -hmm. transport. Can you tell us a little bit more about that initiative and, and how can people get involved? You know, the summary is this. 
the, the breakthroughs are very important because when it comes to sectoral transformation, we, we really need to make sure there is, you know, there is a decarbonization pathway that follows, um, you know, a certain sequence so that we need to, that there is clarity about what to do by when. And because we tend to say net zero as soon as possible, no later than 2050, the moment you mentioned 2050, it kind of gets this connotation that it's gonna happen in the long term. And we need to make sure we avoid that mistake and we say, yes, we have to have clarity about the decarbonization pathway in the long term, but we need to have clarity about what to do in the next five years, what to do in the next year. And the breakthroughs are about that. The breakthroughs will be launched at COP26, which is this you know, conference of the parties, a UN climate conference that happens every year. And the breakthroughs tell us where we need to be by the end of this year, where we need to be, for example, by 2023. So when it comes to uh, you know, clean trucks, we need to have 20% of the you know of, of the truck manufacturers by global revenue joining the race to zero. So if you are a company that produces trucks, we're very interested in, in, in talking to you so that you can be part of this race to zero. It's an initiative for leaders and it's an initiative that will have elements of demand and it will have elements uh, related to policy, but for the purpose of the breakthroughs, the, the language is very focused on the on the supply side. And the vision is to achieve 100% ZEV sales in the tracking sector by 2040. So please join us and I'll be happy to take uh, emails um, and respond to questions that, that your participants may have about these breakthroughs. Amazing, amazing. So everyone in the audience, I, I just put the link in the chat there. Also, if you're open to it, I can put your email there for people to reach out. Um, but Monica, Thank you so much for, for sharing your time, sharing your thoughts and insight. Love the work that you're doing. And uh, I'm excited to, to also track the Breakthrough Challenge as well and uh, encourage everyone to get involved. Great. Thank you for having me. Nick, before I go, there is something very important I want to share with, with your group, which is that next month in March, we're going to launch a very specific campaign for zero emission uh, vehicle commitments. It's going to be done in partnership with the Climate Group. And when you go online to the Race to Zero page, on you know, the transportation page, mm -hmm. you will find a platform. And that platform will have, you know, all the commitments organized by the supply side, demand side, by, by policy, including policies by cities, states, and it will have also space for investors. So the idea is that every single company that commits to zero emission vehicles by COP will be featured there and will have you know, all the information about what they are committing to. So I hope that next month you can visit Race to Zero Transport and you will find a platform and most, important, um, most importantly, you will join that effort that we're putting together. Very exciting. Amazing. That sounds like a really exciting campaign. Uh, I have the link in the chat for the, the page that you mentioned, but also uh, for, for the audience, we can follow up with an email when that campaign is live just to make sure anyone who wants to get involved can get involved from the beginning. Thanks, Monica. Thank you. For anyone interested in working with Monica on the Breakthrough Challenge, link is in chat now. Next up, we move to our, our next startup that is developing a fuel cell for the next generation of heavy transport. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Tim Dummer. I'm the CEO of Proof Energy. It's great to be with you today. I look forward to sharing an overview of Proof Energy's breakthrough fuel cell technology and to questions and discussions later in the session. Proof Energy is targeting two large global markets, electrification of medium and heavy duty vehicles and clean distributed power generation and combined heat and power, CHP. Together, these represent $150 billion global markets, growing to $200 billion per year by 2024. And as we now hear in the media almost every day, the transformation of these markets is accelerating through the work of companies like Tesla and Proterra and increasing government regulations, including India, where polluting diesel generators are being banned in big cities like Delhi, and California's mandate that half of all trucks sold must be zero emissions by 2035. So class three to class eight vehicles are starting to go electric, 
including city transit buses, package delivery vehicles, and long haul trucks. But there's a major problem. Conventional technologies are just not cost effective for medium and heavy duty EVs. Most EVs use lithium ion batteries, but even with the latest cost improvements, this is expensive, typically 50% or more of total vehicle costs. Independent estimates indicate that a battery electric long haul truck with a 500 mile range requires 1200 kilowatt hours or more of battery storage, weighing approximately seven tons and reducing payload capacity by 30 to 50%. Conventional fuel cells also face significant cost, performance, and infrastructure issues. Now I'm going to tell you how we're going to solve this problem. Proof Energy, headquartered in Fremont, California, was founded in 2019 to commercialize breakthrough fuel cell technology developed at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. Proof Energy's power modules will revolutionize the use of fuel cells in both transportation and stationary power applications by delivering an optimum balance of performance and cost. Proof Energy is commercializing breakthrough metal supported solid oxide fuel cells. SOFCs are the highest efficiency of all fuel cells with efficiencies of over 60% for fuel to electricity and over 80% for fuel to energy, electricity plus heat. Our technology also addresses key problems of other fuel cells. In particular, the stainless steel construction is 10 times less expensive than ceramic supported cells. Our metal supported cells are strong and vibration tolerant, even impact resistant and Proof Energy cells can operate using a wide variety of fuels. Even more importantly, Proof Energy power modules are low cost. They're designed around a standard scalable 50 kilowatt stack module. They use low cost raw materials and simple manufacturing processes and readily available fuels and existing infrastructure. The bottom line, Proof Energy fuel cells enable up to a 95% reduction in battery capacity and costs for medium and heavy duty EVs. And due to low capital and operating costs, the proof energy system payback versus diesel is just two and a half years. A standalone business case, even without government subsidies. As mentioned, proof energy cells are fuel agnostic. They can use hydrogen fuel as it becomes increasingly available, cost effective and green. In addition, they can also use other low cost fuels that are wide, widely available today, like ethanol or methanol, which are hydrogen carrier fuels with significantly higher energy density than compressed hydrogen, making them ideal for transportation. We expect our systems and the fuels they use commercially to be tailored to local fuel availability and cost in different geographical regions. For example, ethanol in the US and Brazil, methanol in China. Our preferred fuel is bioethanol, as the crops grown for biofuel production consume more CO2 than is produced by ethanol powered proof energy fuel cells, resulting in a carbon neutral cycle. Thanks for your time today. Please join us on our journey to replace diesel engines and to eliminate up to 10% of global greenhouse gas emissions. I look forward to questions and to following up with you after today's event. All right, just before closing remarks, last poll of the day to connect with Proof Energy. Please use that poll to let us know if you're interested in an email introduction after this. Thank you. That wraps up our event for today. Thank you so much for joining. And we really only touched a handful of topics today, but there's so much more to do in carbon neutrality. So in any case, I have my email again in the chat for anyone who wants to connect with the startups or speakers or ourselves for plug and play to, to learn how to get engaged. And we really, really hope that you enjoy the rest of your day and enjoy the rest of your week. And we look forward to talking with you again soon. Thanks everyone, bye.